On December 18, 1626, a baby was born at the palace of Trekonor in Sweden. This had been the fourth baby to have been born out of King Gustav Adolf and Queen Maria Eleonora, and they hoped this baby would have survived. Maria definitely wished this baby was a boy, but King Gustav was ecstatic over the birth of a little girl. Actually, the midwives for a time thought it was a boy because it cried so loud and it was so hairy. But the king, when they realized it was actually a girl, said, she'll be clever, she's made a fool of us all. They named this baby Christina, and she would become Queen Christina of Sweden, one of the most enigmatic figures in royal history. Welcome back to my channel, guys. My name is Ofelia Santos, and I love talking about histories and mystery. And in this video, we'll be talking about Queen Christina of Sweden, a very enigmatic figure that has definitely taken a revisiting in the last few years. You'll see why. If you like this content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and stay for a while as we're trying to reach to 1,000 subscribers. As to how Christina will grow up, it will be very interesting. Her mother was not allowed a lot of influence in her upbringing as her father, King Gustav Adolf, was afraid Christina would inherit her mental instability. Maria Leonora was a very attractive woman and some might say she was the most beautiful queen ever, but she displayed signs of mental illness from a young age, and this was something that concerned everybody, including her husband, who was afraid the little child would inherit this illness. This royal family belonged to the house of Vasa, and the other person who could potentially become queen, his half-sister Catherine, had married to a Lutheran man. This made Christina the only proper or the only available heir so she was very valuable and she was watched like a hawk they will watch over her like a hawk because of how valuable she was to the house of vasa and to the kingdom of sweden as a whole gustav adolf departed for war on june 30 1630 and this aggravated maria leonora's mental state she wrote to her friends that she was absolutely heartbroken and that she could not really live a life without her husband. She even tried to tell him to please come back home, but he couldn't because this was not any war. This was Europe's bloodiest war of religion and he was out there protecting Protestantism. His Royal Majesty died on November 1632 on the battlefield and his body was transported on a solemn procession in which little Christina was present. Maria Leonora was absolutely heartbroken over this and she would not allow for his body to be buried but finally chancellor axel Osten oxenstierna finally was able to bury the body of his majesty and protect it as she tried to unearth it so we see here that this was a woman who needed a lot of mental help that was sadly not available at the time and people were often cruel to her because of this as it has happened with many other figures across history that have displayed signs of mental illness. By this time, Christina finally got the attention from her mother that she so desperately wanted and needed. But this is when we see Christina's really interesting personality, which is part of why she's been revisited in history lately and has even gained a fan following. Christina was described as a tomboy, or what we some people will describe as a tomboy. She didn't really like most of the female, most things females would do. She quite felt bored about them. Her father had requested she undergo the education of a prince, so maybe that caused some influence over what were her tastes, her likes, and her dislikes. But her mother sadly lost custody of her due to her reputation as a tough person and sadly her mental illness. Oxenstierna actually had to banish her to a castle only permitting her visitations with her daughter. And it is believed here, according to the evidence we have at hand, that Christina's personality and education and life prosper under these new arrangements. Christina that will then be raised by her aunt and foster mother, who will pass away in 1638. Eva Reining and Beata Oxenstierna would then be the ones who would be primarily in charge of the 
education and the upbringing of the little queen as well as in charge of the ladies in waiting and the role be known as the castigation mistress and this was basically like a governess like the role of a governess and a chief lady in waiting for the little queen in the meantime Alex Axel of Santierna would be the chancellor and she will have a regency council watching out for her allowing for the government to continue on as the little queen was growing up. Christina would spend up to 10 hours a day studying and she would only sleep two or three or four hours each night. And this was something that marked Christina as a person a lot. She devoured <laughs> she devoured those books. She devoured education. She loved it. She lived and breathed and just existed to learn and to be more educated as a person. So she had an, a great, a bright intelligence. When it comes to her physical appearance, it is possible she had a hunched back and a bit of a misaligned shoulders. Um, this will be medical, medical issues that back then would not really have a solution. And they have been mentioned quite a lot, so it's probable it was true to an extent. She walked like a man, she cursed like a sailor, she talked like a, a guy, you know, she didn't really had this more feminine approach to interpersonal relationships that we would associate in the modern day with a woman. Um, and she was very proud of it. She was very proud of being very masculine and she she loved it. This was something that people who visited Christina and who met her in real life were very shocked by uh, because when we see when we think of queens, specifically queens back then, um, we think them as very feminine, very powerful, but very feminine women and Christina was very much the opposite. But Christina was very proud of her more masculine approach to a life and people thought of it as very strange and not at all common. Some people thought she was crazy, but no, she was. She, she that was that's how she preferred to approach life. And there has been a lot of questions, a lot of curiosity about her androgyny, about her gender identity. And out of respect for Queen Christina of Sweden, I am not going to say who she was or how she identified because the truth is we don't really know we have these notes we have these records we have this but out of respect i'm not going to label christina because the truth is we don't really know this could have simply been her preference to dressing or this could have this could have been um more the same things happen with her sexuality. From a very young age, Christina was very interested in Catholicism and chastity. And although she was engaged to her cousin Charles, she had a disdain for matrimony and she had a disdain for a married life. She did not want to have children. She didn't want to get married. And it appears she had a preference for women. Um, there have been some records that she and, and some letters that she wrote to other women in her life that might have a romantic approach But again out of respect out of the fact that I was not there I'm not gonna say that she was in relationships with these women because Historians don't seem to be on the same page. Some historians say that absolutely these letters were romantic in nature or sexual in nature and that is very likely that she was romantically and sexually involved with women like Ella Spar, um, a, a singer, I forgot her name right now, a, an Italian singer uh, alongside other women in her life. But other historians are like, absolutely not. They were simply friends. She wrote like this to other people. And there have even been rumors that she was romantically involved with a cardinal named Cardinal, cardinal Asiolino. So when it comes to Christina's gender identity and sexuality, we don't really know. Historians are very confused. Historians are fascinated. Uh, what we do know is that she is a fascinating personality on her own, but we don't really know the extent of these letters, the extent of her relationship with the woman around her, or even Cardinal Asolino, or how she thought of herself in when it comes to her gender identity. So I'm just trying to be respect respectful here with Christina of Sweden. But let me know in your comment section. Let me know what you think. Do you think um, she? Uh, do you think these romantic relationships 
were real. She actually did engage in these, these romantic relationships with with Eva Spar, with Rachel, with Gabriel and Angelina. Your um, and Angelina, or do you think they were friends, or do you think they were? historical friends if you know what i mean um, just let me know what you think i think it's a fascinating conversation topic honestly on its own it deserves its own video another of christina's passions was art christina loved the arts when i mean she loved the arts is like she loved the arts she was a patron of the arts and that's one of the things she is renowned as today so as christina grew up there has been even more fascination for her political views and for many of her passions such as art which we'll get there in a minute but i just want to make sure that you know by this point there had been some tension between axel oxentierna and christina of sweden due to their very different differing approaches to the wars of religion and their different political views. Cancel Chancellor Oxentierna was very adamant that the war must continue. Meanwhile, Christina thought peace was the option and she fought and she sent delegates to many of these diets and many of these meetings in order to make sure that not only peace was achieved, but that Sweden came out winning and she got her way and she kept fighting to make to sideline Oxentierna to sideline him even more and to take power away from him and more power to herself and this caused a lot of discomfort this became according to what I read this became a point of contention between them but this did not stop here her personal life affected much of what will happen to her on her later years. And this is when we come to her arts. Christina loved the arts. And when the wars of religion came to an end, the troops actually made, her troops actually looted the Prague castle and stole many of the valuable art pieces that belonged to Emperor Rudolf II. When I mean many, I mean that they basically depleted the castle. 760 paintings. 33,000 coins, hundreds of manuscripts, hundreds of bronze and marble statues, hundreds of scientific instruments. They took them all and they brought them back to Stockholm for Christina. And Christina loved them. Christina spent much of her life collecting manuscripts, collecting books, collecting just items that were um, of, the, of a lot of academic value to her. But this also cost a lot of money. So Christina spent a lot of money on education. She loved studying um, Neosticism, philosophy, history, language, ancient Greek. She even studied Islam. And she even brought this, bought this book. She obtained a copy of this book called The Three Imposters. The book was called The Treaty of the Three Imposters. And it was a book that, very controversial it cast doubt upon major organized religion. So this meant that Christina was a very academic, a, a scholarly person. But once again, this costed a lot of money, but she was even, and this money had to come out of somewhere. So people were trying to tell her like, slow down because this is becoming quite an obsession. There have been comments by others saying that this was almost like a mania to Christina to constantly learn, to constantly, um, you know, obtain all these things, collect them. And there was a point in her life, a very uh, early in her reign, that Christina suffered a nervous breakdown. And the doctors told her that you need to stop, you need to calm down. This is not healthy. You're sleeping three, four hours each night. You're studying up to 10, 12 hours a day. On top of the work you have to do as a queen, you need to slow down. And this is when Christina slowed down a bit. She did it a bit. She found a passion for Catholicism. Realized she actually, much of her religious views align more with the Catholic religion, the Roman Catholic religion. Um, if you know, there, um, there are a few, there's Orthodox Catholicism and there's the Roman Catholic uh, Catholicism and she aligned herself more with the Roman Catholicism and she wished to convert, but this presented other problems like Sweden was a Protestant nation back then. She, when she was crowned, she was crowned by 1650, she already had this inclinations, as I mentioned, for Catholicism 
and this is when she had a nervous breakdown. And this is when she took Catholicism very seriously. But by this point, Christina had lost much of her popularity. The coronation of Chris Queen Christina was absolutely beautiful. It was gorgeous. But just to make a, an image, when the first carriage that carried Christina and carried her entourage arrived to the cathedral, the last carriage hadn't even left the palace. That's how massive and expensive her coronation was. And that is something that, just like being a very scholarly person, marked Christina, the overspending. As I mentioned, her passion for education required a lot of money. Her passion for education required a lot of resources. She even corresponded with René Descartes and she even met him, even though that meeting didn't when they met in person, they didn't really get along. But her passion for the arts, her passion for theater, her passion for learning came at a financial cost. And Christina, by this point, she really, she was second guessing many things. She had been queen for a very long time since she was a child. And even though she was crowned in 1650, by 1654, she decided to abdicate in favor of Charles Gustav. She sported her regalia, it was taken from her one by one, and she took off her crown. And she left after many years of being a queen, but just four years after her coronation, which was very interesting when I read about it. I thought it was a really interesting detail. She had been queen for all these years, but she had barely been coronated when she decided to abdicate. And she abdicated and she moved to Rome. And in Rome, she was celebrated because she was now, she had been wanted to convert to Catholicism and she was celebrated. But in Rome, once the Swedish population, when the Swedish people realized she had converted to Catholicism, they cut her off. So she was able to secure a loan and use many of her books as payment. And this is when her and, As and Cardinal Asiolino really became besties. They would often talk about arts, talk about religion, talk about many of these scholarly things. And Asiolino was even reprimanded for spending so much time with her. But she was received by the Pope and by many of the Italian Catholics in great style. And she even opened an academy where she fostered the arts and philosophy and history and all these things that she was able to now indulge in in all this splendor and Queen Christina was basically a fixture a really interesting fixture in the Vatican she was even a mediator between France and Spain for a time as they were fighting over Naples and there are evidence there is some evidence that she was offered the crown of Naples you know she didn't become Queen of Naples of course she didn't become Queen of Naples however on the 15th of October 1659 it all came crashing down for her her master of the horse was a man named the Marquis, Marquis Gian Rinaldo Monaldeschi. And Gian Rinaldo was her master of the horse, he was a Marquis, he was very close to her. He was basically part of her household and in her inner circle. And Queen Cristina was suspecting that Gian Rinaldo was being disloyal to her. We don't know what happened. We don't know what happened here. We don't know what exactly Gian Rinaldo saw, heard, read, witnessed. We don't know what Christina told him. We don't know the extent of the events. All we know is Queen Christina confronted Gian Rinaldo. And the confrontation didn't go down well. He was murdered by Ludovico Santinelli. He was stabbed by this guy. He was stabbed several times in the neck and in the chest, stomach area. And he, of course, died. And this has been a mystery that has been so enigmatic, not only to historians, but to myself. I really went down the rabbit hole of knowing exactly what happened with Gian Rinaldo Monaldeschi, what happened between him and Cristina. But there are only rumors. And I can't sit down here and tell you that, oh, yes, this is exactly what happened. Uh, some rumors are said that he found out about her and Asiolino. Other rumors said that she was... Uh, we don't really know. We don't know the extent. I think it's absolutely fascinating how well this being kept a secret. And all this went down and the King of France visited Christina to sort these things out. Y'all, this is... You hear how crazy I sound? You hear how insane this has been? Like, this man was murdered by Ludovico. Christina was present. We don't know what happened. And all we know is the King of France 
visit Christina to be like, what happened here? I get chills. This is like out of a novel. I get chills just thinking about what happened. Just thinking about what exactly this guy saw and witnessed. Just so his life was taken away. That's my computer. <laughs> this all happened away from Rome, away from the Vatican. And when she made her way to the Vatican and to Rome once again, she was not received as enthusiastically because this is what the people heard. Italian Marquis was killed by a foreigner. It did not went down well for her. And this stained her reputation so much that to this day, we talk about it. This is one of the things that she was known for. Not only for being a patron of the arts, but also for the murder of this guy. And all she said was due to this loyalty, whatever that meant for her. I don't know, but I want to know what happened. However, she stayed in Rome her entire life. She lived in a palace and she kept hosting parties and hosting dignitaries and hosting the high uh, people of the highest echelons of society. And she was a very elegant person. She passed away at 64 years old in 1689. And she asked the Pope for a simple burial. She just wanted something very simple, very plain. But the Pope insisted that she be given a grandiose funeral procession, which she was given. And she is interred. She's buried at Grote Vaticane, which is this, um, it's not a crypt, but many men are buried there many important men from the vatican are buried there and she's the she's one of three women being buried in that place it's very very fascinating queen christina had a very fascinating very interesting life um she went from being this queen her entire life since she was a child to being very obsessed with learning and education and the arts and it's kind of kind of strange how this all even came, um, was part of her downfall in Sweden and then she was received in Rome and in France and all these places and the whole Gian Rialdo situation she had a life like she had a very interesting life you let me know what you think what well, was Queen Christina engaging in these relationships with these women or was with Queen Christina not doing those things? What Queen Christina involved in the death? What do you think happened with Gian Rinaldo? I am very interested to know your thoughts. What do you think happened there? Let me know what you think in the comment section down below and I'll see you on the next video with more facts about history and mystery. Bye.